Hello everyone, welcome to the linear accessory course. In this video, I'm gonna show you how we can uh, drive the Euler Bernoulli beam model based on the variational principle of uh, the principle of minimum potential energy. So this is variation information of Euler Bernoulli beam model based on the principle of minimum total potential energy. So before we go deeply through the formulation, let us discuss the Euler Bernoulli beam. It is a uh, it is a beam theory. But we do have, in addition to this beam, we do have two motion beams, we, uh, beam theory, we do have higher order beam theories, so we do have lots of beam theories, actually. One of them, and the simplest form of these beam theories is the euler Bernoulli beam that is used a lot in many applications that involve beam structures. So, <coughs> what I'm going to show you here, we first, we're going to discuss the main assumptions behind the euler Bernoulli beam theory, that the first assumption that we do have small deformation, Small deformation, it means that we do have a small or a small strain. This means that we can, if we decided to solve this beam structure, it means that the main kinematical variable that is going to describe the deformation or the change in dimensions and shape of the beam structure, it's going to be the infinitesimal strain tensor, which is epsilon ij. And this means that we're already working as linear, uh, uh, which the same strain tensor that we're already using in linear elasticity. And in addition to this, we're going to assume that we're already working uh, or the beam is made of linear elastic material, it means that there is no nonlinearity in the system. It means that this beam formulation that we are going to discuss here is going to be for linear uh, stru beam structures, that, and the, there is no nonlinearity due to the geometry uh, or due to large deformation, or even there is no uh, nonlinearity due to the material elasticity. One of the essential or some of the essential uh, assumptions of the euler bernoulli beam theory that the normal to the beam axis remains straight after deformation. So to understand this, this point, let us consider this beam structure. And something that you should not understand about beam structure, that how they are different from bars or, be, or, 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 or rods, for example, beam structure, it, should, it, it have the ability to support transverse fluid. It means that the force that is going to act over the beam, it's going to have effect on the beam in the transverse direction, in the direction that is normal to the axis of the beam itself. Because of this transverse force, this beam, it should be bended. It is going to bend, as you know from the mechanics of material class. So this is a beam structure, and here we are doing the formulation of this equation that used to ha use for the mechanics of material class. But here we're going to drive and we're going to uh, figure out the uh, concept behind this equation that we used to use them before. So starting with the first assumption here, which is the, the normal to the beam axis, it should remain straight after deformation. Like this is the axis of the beam. This is the neutral axis of the beam as long as we do have straight beams. And this is going to be the normal to this axis. This is the perpendicular line that is normal to the axis. So this normal to the beam axis, after deformation, it will still remain normal to the beam axis and according to the euler bernoulli beam theory. But this is not necess necessary to be the case for all beam structures. We do have two motion beam structure, for example, for these two motion beams, this normal, it is not necessary to be normal, to be still normal after deformation. After deformation, it would attain a different angle and it would not, it is not necessary to be normal to the beam axis after deformation. But according to the Euler Bernoulli beam theory, this is a condition, this is one of the main assumptions of Euler Bernoulli beam theory, that the normal to the beam axis, we are assuming that it will be still normal after deformation. This is before deformation. And we here, we just cut it a portion. We just cut it a small part. And due to the external force, this part will be deflected. The beam, that the beam will be deflected in such a way this part will be moved down. And definitely the axis will be kind of build, bended. So that's why we don't have like bending in the beam or which is associated with the curvature of the beam axis. Like we're going to have end up, we're going to end up with a curvature into this beam axis. And this is the normal to the beam axis will still remain normal after deformation according to the Euler Bernoulli beam theory. This is one assumption. And the, this, which is the third assumption here that the normal to the beam axis remain normal to the beam axis after deformation. Another assumption that this normal remains straight after deformation. And this assumption is common between Euler Bernoulli beam theory and Tomoshenko beam theory, that this normal it is a straight line after deformation, it is still a straight line. But for some reason, 
some other more advanced beam structure theories that they consider that there is a possibility for this normal to be deformed after deformation. It is not necessary to be straight, to be bended, to attain any other shape. This is what already considered in the higher order, uh, higher order beam theories. But in the euler bernoulli beam theory, we are assuming these are the two main assumptions, that the normal remain normal after deformation and straight after deformation. Make sense? So given these assumptions here, what we would like to do is to drive the equilibrium equations based on the minimum of uh, the principle of minimum potential energy, total potential energy, uh, or based on a variational method. And to drive this equation, the first thing that we have to discuss here is the displacement field. Even we, what, what we're going to discuss or what we're going to do here is going to be typically the same thing that we did for the bar problem, for example, that we used to start by a displacement field, then from this displacement field, we're going to form the strain field, the stress field, then we can substitute the equation, equilibrium equation. If we substituted the stress field and the strain field into the equilibrium equation and we solve the equilibrium equation, here we are working based on the Newtonian method. But for the variational method, we have to form the strain energy and we have to find the first variation of these strain energies and we have to form the total potential energy and we have to find the first variation of this total potential energy to end up with the equilibrium equations as long, uh, and the boundary condition. And this is the thing that we're going to do in this video. Make sense? So we're going to start here by finding, I'm just going to explain to you the displacement field for euler bernoulli beam theory. But this displacement field, it is constant for any euler bernoulli beam theory. It is well known and it is well established and we are using it directly. But I'm gonna show you how did we drive this, uh, this displacement field. To explain this point, let us pick a point that belong to the normal to the beam axis, any point, whatever it is. Or first of all, let us choose the point that belong to the normal to the beam axis, but in the meanwhile, it is over the axis of the beam, which is this midpoint of this plane. This is like a plane uh, over the, uh, the normal plane to the beam axis. So choosing this point, and because of the external force, definitely this point has been moved here because of this beam has been deflected and bended. So if we decided to figure out the displacement of this point, we're gonna find that this point has been moved down vertical in this way with a certain distance that it had been moved to the right so the or horizontal so we do have two directions here or we do have two displacements one displacement parallel to the z-axis which we're going to give it the symbol as w and another displacement that is parallel to the x-axis which is actual displacement which we're going to give it a symbol like u0 so this U0, this is the axial displacement. We're going to say that U0, this is the axial displacement of a point belongs to the beam axis. We just choose this point that belongs to the beam axis and we move this point down with this value, right? Then how about the, the W? W, this is the transverse. This is the transverse. Transverse displacement of a point belong, belongs to the beam axis. Which, then we're gonna call this one as the beam deflection. This is commonly known as the beam deflection, even if you remember from the statics class that you used to define this or find this beam deflection, which is W, right? So, but this is, a, this is generally the transverse displacement of this point that belongs to the beam axis. The transverse, it means that this is in the uh, direction, this is the displacement in the direction that is normal to the axis of the beam. So this is the beam axis in the normal direction, this is the transverse direction. So that's why it is generally the transverse displacement of that point that belongs to the beam axis. Make sense? But how about the any other point that does not belong? Still to me, uh, belong to this normal to the beam axis, but it is not belonging in the meanwhile 
it is not belonging to the axis of the beam and instead it is somehow shifted up or down like let us choose this point so what is the z coordinate what is the coordinate of this point it will this point it will attain a z coordinate and this z coordinate is going to be negative so it, it is already like negative z negative z coordinate where z this define the location of this of this point like the the point on the top here is going to have a z coordinate this z coordinate is going to equal to the h over 2 assuming that this h it is the total height of the beam so it's going to be like negative h over 2 make sense anyway so this point after the formation it will be here right where this distance still this negative z this distance should be the negative z that we already have so what's going to happen now we would like to figure out the the horizontal and the vertical displacement of this point in general so if we did so let us to, to explain this point let us draw first the normal this is the way where the normal plane was before the formation it was vertical now it had been rotated with an angle this angle it is very small angle or like a small angle which can be related to the beam deflection as w comma x according to the euler bonelli beam w comma x this is the first derivative of this w this w this is the beam deflection which should be function of x what does it mean function of x if you bend it a beam this point here it will have zero displacement for example if it is fixed from here and fixed from there but the other point will be bended right so the displacement here the vertical displacement of this point is zero but here it has a displacement increasing 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 and so on so this beam deflection it is a function of x changes from one point to the other point over the beam axis so that's why it is a function of x the first derivative of this displacement gives an angle because the angle as you remember it, it should be dimensionless so dw by dx which mirror divided by mirror gives dimensionless this is going to give us an angle what is angle this is going to give us the angle of rotation here and according to euler bernoulli beam the theory that we are assuming that this we are assuming small deformation and the normal remain normal after deformation and so it means that the normal will be only allowed to rotate a small angle which somehow this angle of rotation this angle of rotation theta this theta approximately equal to the slope or the slope of a changing or the variation of the deflection with respect to the beam axis over the beam axis which is w comma x this is based on the assumptions of the euler bernoulli beam theory this is the angle of rotation of the normal after the formation to keep it normal after the formation make sense so if i ask you to find or to describe the, the, the horizontal displacement of this point the horizontal displacement of this point with respect to this point this point was the neutral point. This is the point that belongs to the neutral plane or the axis of the beam, right? So what is the displacement? As you can see, this horizontal displacement here, we're going to give it like ux. And this is the x-coordinate of the displacement field that we are going to describe or define. So as you can see, ux, it should be a little bit bigger than u0 with a small amount, this amount, with an amount, this amount, it should be this distance right it should be bigger by this distance than u0 right so if i decided to define ux in terms of u0 we're gonna say that here we're gonna talk about the displacement field so first start with the displacement field so we're gonna say that ux equals u0 plus something right it should be u0 plus another distance right what is this horizontal distance if we consider this little bit small triangular shape this triangle here this is the new point that we are calculating at and this is the point that belongs to the beam axis right and we said that this angle this a little bit small angle here in between this angle this is the w comma x angle right so, and what is this height? What is this distance? This distance, it should be the negative z. So if I ask you to find this distance, how much it is? 
So simply, this distance is going to be, because it is the opposite, right? This distance is going to be the negative z, the sine of the angle, which is w comma x. Agree? And since this angle it is a small angle, and if you remember that from the linear elasticity or from the mechanics of material or from any uh, so many courses that you studied before, and since and this is since we're already working as linear elasticity and we're assuming small deformation, small deformation it means that this angle is small. If we decided to apply or expand this sign, this trigonometric sinusoidal function. Uh, into multiple terms using Taylor expansion, for example, the f we gonna and we gonna neglect all the higher order terms, and we're just gonna consider the first linear term, because we're already working in a small deformation. So for a small deformation, for a small, for a small deformation, sine omega comma x, which just the angle sine theta, it should equal approximately w comma x directly. Even if you remember from the vibration class, you used to define the sine theta equal theta and the cosine theta equals one if we decided to work and in, 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 do linearization of this trigonometric function. So this is the linearized form because we are already working as linear. So we can simply say that this term is z, the negative z w comma x. So in so we're going to end up that ux it should be u0 plus this extra term, which is negative z w comma x. So we're going to end up that plus another term here plus the negative z w comma x. So this negative times positive gives negative here. So we're going to end up. So we're going to end up here with we're going to remove we can remove this negative to have the uh negative z w comma x and this is going to give us the ux this displacement and this this is the x component of the displacement field that we have to define in order to form then the the strain field the stress field and so on make sense so this is for the horizontal displacement ux how about the vertical displacement if i ask you to find the vertical displacement of this point it was there on the top, <coughs> it was here. Then this point has been moved down all the way till this point. So this should be the vertical displacement, right? Can you find this vertical displacement in terms, this height, in terms of W, how much it is? So simply this height, it should be, so it, it should be from this point we do have all the way it is W. So this total distance from here to there, this total distance, it should equal to W, right, plus the negative 6, negative Z, or plus Z, whatever it is, just this height. But remember that this height as well, but how about this distance? This distance, it should equal to the negative Z, the cosine of theta, which is W comma X. And we said that as long as we are working small deformation, this cosine theta should equal to 1. So this is going to give us just negative z. So as you can see, we're already adding negative z and we're subtracting negative z here. So this vertical distance from this point to this point definitely is going to be w as well. It will be the same w. So the vertical displacement of any point that belong to the normal to the beam axis Whatever this point is over the beam axis or any other point, the vertical displacement is the same. For all of them equals W, which is going to be considered as a feature thing to the beam is known as the beam deflection. Make sense? Why? Because we are already working in small deformation assumption, linear elasticity. Make sense? So that's why, or uh, in, in linear theory. Uh, linear in the geometry. So there is linearization in the geometry. So this explains that why this indicates that the vertical displacement of this point to this point, this vertical displacement, it should equal to the UZ. This is the Z component of the displacement. And this UX, it should be the uh, horizontal displacement or the X component of the displacement of the beam. So we can write here, we can write that we do have the uz definitely is going to be the w as already given here make sense so this is going to give us the displacement field and something that
that you should understand that this beam it is deflected in only one direction this is two dimensional beam there is no deflection in the third direction it means that in the y direction there is no displacement in the y direction so that's why here because we're already working in two dimension so this ui will be definitely zero make sense and something that you should understand also that this deflection it is a function of x this displacement u zero it is also a function of x so we can write this thing as to be more accurate here that this should be function of x negative z w comma x as a function of x and this definitely is a function of x make sense so this is gonna give us that this u x it is function of x and z but this one is only function of x right because there is z coordinate here this is this is independent of the z coordinate this is this this displacement field it is commonly known for any oil or bernoulli beam whatever it is so what does it mean it means there is no need even to drive this displacement field as i did here this is something to understand how we did drive this displacement field but this is in a way the displacement field for the euler bernoulli beam theory make sense now since we do have this displacement field can we form the strain field of an euler bernoulli beam yes which is epsilon ij so the epsilon the strain field it should be like six component and the general expression of the strain field it should equal to the one over two u i comma j plus u j comma i as we agreed right so we do have so many components we do have epsilon x x epsilon x x it should equal to the u x comma x right if you just substitute it here so it's gonna be u x comma x it means that you're gonna find the first derivative of the displacement field u x with respect to x so the derivative this is gonna give us u zero comma x right negative z is just constant and we do have w comma x x so this is going to be the second derivative of w with respect to x because w which is the beam deflection there should be there was only there there was only first derivative so we're going to end up with a second derivative for epsilon x x make sense how about epsilon y y epsilon y y it should be u y comma y u y is already zero so it's going to be zero how about the u z z epsilon z z it's going to give us the u z comma z this is going to give us the w comma z which should be zero why because this w is function only of x it, it is not dependent uh, on the on the z coordinate how about the epsilon x y epsilon x y should equal to the one over two u x comma y plus the u y comma x so it's going to give us the u x comma y there is no y dependence of x u x is just function of x or z so this term should be zero and we don't have ui so this is gonna give us zero even if you tried so we have tried here uxx uyy uh, i'm sorry uh, epsilon xx epsilon yy epsilon zz and epsilon x xy how about epsilon xz so it's gonna be one over two ux comma z plus uz comma x ux comma z it do depend on x it do depend on x so this is gonna give us equals one over two times u x comma z which this term would be zero it is independent of z but the derivative of this this term with respect to z gives negative w comma x plus the derivative of u z with respect to x the derivative of u z with respect to x this is going to give us the w comma x this term will be cancelled with this term so we're going to end up as well with with zero even if you tried epsilon y z this is the last term one over two u y comma z there is no y and u z comma y there is no y dependence of these variables right so this is going to give us zero so as you can see in the euler bernoulli beam theory we do have the strain field there is only one component and the other five components all of them are zeros as we just demonstrated right and this is also one of the things that you should understand about this euler bernoulli beam theory that it only account for the stretch in the beam this is the actual strain this is the actual strain of the beam and this epsilon xz it should be the transverse this is known as the transverse transverse strain shear strain i'm sorry because it is already shear strain this is the transverse shear strain
Something that you should understand about the Euler Bernoulli beam theory that it does not account for any transverse strain effect. But Tomoshenko beam theory, for example, it do affect. Why? Because Tomoshenko beam theory, which is a more advanced theory than this one, it assumed that this normal it can rotate. And it is not necessary to be normal after the formation. It can be at any angle with respect to the beam axis. But since euler bernoulli beam theory assumed that this normal remains normal after the formation, it means that indirectly, the euler bernoulli beam theory does not account for the transverse shear strain, or in other words, the epsilon xz in the, in the beam theory will be zero in the euler bernoulli beam theory. But in Tomoshenko beam theory, this epsilon will have a value. Make sense? And that's why here we'd have only one axial strain. This is based on the, and this is the simplest form, by the way, of the beam theory, as we mentioned before. So this is for the strain field. Then after the strain field, we can form the stress field. So as you can see, nothing new over the procedure that we applied before for one dimensional problem that we solved before. But the new thing here that you just understand the theory and the concept of the beam theory, euler bernoulli beam theory, and how we did drive it this how how did, how we drive it, these equations? But anyway, you're gonna start all the time from this set of equations, then you're gonna move. Also, one of the things, just to make it more simple, actually, this u zero, you this u zero, this is the axial, the horizontal displacement of the point that belongs to the beam axis, right? In the beam applications, the transverse displacement, in, in, in comparison to the horizontal, the axial displacement is very negligible. I'm sorry, the, uh, the, X, uh, the horizontal displacement U0, in comparison to the beam deflection, it is very negligible, very small. So in many cases, especially as long as we're assuming small deformation, but if we're assuming large deformation and there is like stretching in the beam axis, this U0 should be considered. But here, since we are working as a small deformation, that is fine to neglect the effect of U0 or assume that this U0 in comparison to the beam deflection W is very negligible, then you're going to remove this one from the equations. So this is something that we can write here. We're going to say that for a small, in many cases, U0 will be too small in comparison to the W. So for this case, that is fine. That is fine. to assume that u0 nearly equal 0, or that is fine to assume this thing and neglect u0, remove u0 from the uh, equations. Make sense? So if we did so, and we move in the stress, but in a way, you can consider this one, but this one is going to give like an extra degrees of, degree of freedom. Because why? Because we do have here in the euler Bernoulli beam, we do have two degrees of freedom, u0 and the deflection itself. This like two different displacement, right? Because simply, I can only stretch the beam. I can only bend the beam. And I can do both. So these are like two independent degrees of freedom. So to make it more simple, and under the assumption that U0 is too small in comparison to the beam deflection, that is fine to neglect the U0. So you're going to end up with only one single degree of freedom. And in this case, the equilibrium equation should be only one equation, instead of being two. Make sense? So... Going to the stress field. So we here we're gonna form the stress field. We would have the stress equation as sigma ij for linear elastic materials as lambda epsilon rr delta ij plus the two mu epsilon ij. Okay. So your objective is just to block here. So how about the sigma xx? It should equal to the lambda times the epsilon xx plus epsilon yy plus epsilon zz, this is the general form, plus the two mu epsilon xx, right? But here we don't have any epsilons except the epsilon xx, only one epsilon, one strain field that we do have, right? So we're going to end up, or we'll just leave it in this form, so we're going to end up that sigma xx, in this case, it's got, is going to be lambda plus two mu times epsilon xx. How about sigma xy? It should equal to the 2 mu epsilon xy. Also, it's going to be 0 because there is no epsilon xy. And so on. Epsilon xz, sigma xz, sigma yz will be zeros. But how about sigma yy and sigma zz? Both are going to be equal, equal to the lambda times epsilon xx only. 
Why? Because this should be like sigma y y should be lambda epsilon x x because this term is common between all between all all of the normal stresses. So this is gonna give us lambda epsilon x x plus epsilon y y plus epsilon z z plus two mu epsilon y y. There is no epsilon y y, but we still have lambda epsilon uh, x x. This is gonna give us it is already because the lambda which is new e over one plus new times one uh, one negative two new. If you substitute with the Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio, you're gonna find that this one equals to the new sigma x x, which is this sigma x x. Make sense? So this is gonna give us the stress field, and even we can simply can assume that this term as E star. We can assume that this is like an equivalent Young's modulus that account for the effect of the Poisson's ratio. And this explains why when we do the flexural bending test for a beam, we find the Young's modulus different than the Young's modulus that we end up with from the tensile test. If we did a tensile test of a material, the material is subjected to tension. There is no bending here. So we're going to measure the Young's modulus of the material with a certain value. But if we did the frictional bending test for a beam structure, we're going to end up with another value of the Young's modulus of this beam or this material. But this Young's modulus, it, why it is different? Because it is actually, it should be lambda plus 2 mu, which are the two lambda constants. It means that it already incorporates the effect of the Boston's ratio already embedded inside this, uh, this E star. Anyway, so you can see that sigma x x it is e times epsilon like the conventional Hooke's law, but this it should be the flexural Young's modulus that to, or the flexural modulus of the beam, not the conventional Young's model that we obtain from the tensile test, unless you neglect the effect of the Boston's ratio and the transverse uh, normal stresses which are sigma y y sigma z z they can be related to the normal axial stress as epsilon uh, new uh, sigma x x makes sense this is for the stress field if we decided to work with the newtonian method we have to plug this stress field into the equilibrium equation then we have to come up with the boundary conditions and so on as we did before for the one dimensional problems of power for example but as i mentioned this it is not preferred to use the Newtonian method for the beam structure. Why? Because the equations or beam basically, one of the essential features or measures in the beam is the bending stress, bending moment. Like we do have any beam to can be bended, right? So there should be like kind of bending moment here. So how we can find this bending moment? We don't have any bending moment. We just form the stresses, and then if we plug into the equations, equilibrium equation, we can find the stress, and that's it. And no problem. That is fine. But how about the bending moment? How we can find the beam deflection, which are the essential measures that we practically use for these beam structures? We cannot find these things directly using the uh, Newtonian method unless you should understand the beam structure and how it works and you know how you can form the bending moment in terms of the stress, the normal stress is sigma x x and sigma y y z z that we already drive it down there. How you can come up with the bending moment in terms of the sigma x x, for example, you should understand and you should have this formula. But if in case that you don't have this thing, you won't gonna able to do it unless you use a variational method, and this is what we're gonna use. So now we're gonna use a variational method that depend on forming the phase, the total potential energy, then finding the phase variation of this total potential energy, and this is the thing that we're gonna do. So here we're gonna apply. Here we are going to apply the principle of minimum. total potential energy. And that is states that the sum, as we drive it, this one in the previous video, that this minimum potential energy, it should be, it is like the first variation of the total potential energy, it should be zero, right? This is the principle itself. So to do so, we have to find first, the find the first variation of the strain energy, right? We have to find the first variation of the strain energy for this beam structure, okay? And if you remember that we drive it or we wrote the first variation of the strain energy, we can start by forming the strain energy first, then we're gonna find the first variation of this strain energy, or we can 
like like we can do it directly. So we we drive it this one in terms of the stresses, by the way, in, into this form. We drive it this one at the integration over the volume of sigma ij, the first variation of epsilon ij, dv, if you remember from the previous video, right? And we already form in the stress field and we already have the strain field. So we do have everything. So if I decided to write this one into the expanded form, what is the expanded form of this term? So it should be the integration. This is something that you should understand. It should be the integration of sigma xx delta epsilon xx plus the sigma yy, the first variation of epsilon yy plus the sigma zz, the first variation of epsilon zz plus, because all of this i and j, these are dummy indices, so it should be repeated. Plus we do have the sigma xy the delta of epsilon xy plus would have sigma y x by the way if it, uh, times delta epsilon y x but both epsilon xy epsilon y x they are equal the same thing for the sigma xy and sigma y x but originally because the tensor is say nine component in general the stress tensor the cylinder should be nine component but there are six independent components. Why? Because we have two components or three components that they are identical. The of the diagonal components in the stress and strain tensor they are identical. But in or in the uh, originally there are nine independent and they are nine components, and we have to sum all of them here into the formation of the strain energy uh, of this beam structure or any other structure or any other elastic material. So this is going to give us also, so this is for xx and yx, we do have also sigma xz, the first variation of epsilon xz, plus the sigma zx times the first variation of epsilon zx, plus the sigma yz, the first variation of yz, plus the sigma zy the first time the first variation of zy. All of this should be integrated over the volume. So this is going to give us the, this is the expanded form of this compact form. Make sense? So as you can see, this term and this term both are identical, the same. So we can sum them and multiply times two. And this term is the same like this term, and we can sum them and multiply times two, the same thing here. And this explains in some of the textbook, they write gamma xy, which should equal to the double of epsilon xy. This gamma, they drive this gamma from, from this part based on the principle of minimization of potential energy. And this what explain gamma, which is the shear strain tensor in some of the textbooks, especially the undergraduate textbooks. Make sense? But originally it should be written in terms of the epsilon and this explain why we do have this gamma at the double of epsilon xy. Anyway, so this is for the first variation of U into this form and if we decided to do for this beam structure for this beam structure as you can see we don't have we don't have epsilon y y there is no epsilon z z x y x z y z so all of these terms will be zero 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 because we don't have these strains right except all of these eight strains are zeros except this strain so we're gonna end up here for the first variation so this is gonna give us the first variation of u the total strain energy, it should equal to the integration over the volume of sigma xx times the first variation of epsilon xx dv. Now we would like to form this variation in terms of the displacement. But which displacement? The displacement, the generalized displacement that we are interested in finding, which is the beam deflection. If going back again to the displacement field, we said that in general, we have two degrees of freedom, ux, u0, and w, which is the beam deflection. And here we are assuming that u0 is too small to the w, so that's why we remove this u0. Now we have to form the variation in terms of the beam deflection. We need it in terms of the beam deflection, in terms of w. So how we can do so, your objective is just to plug or substitute first this epsilon. Into this form, we got the epsilon as u0, this term will be canceled, negative z, w, comma, xx. Plug this value here into this expression down there. So we're going to end up with integration over the volume of sigma xx, the first variation of the negative z, w comma xx, dv. Now we have to get rid of these derivatives 
to form the delta as a function or the first variation of, or form this variation in terms of the delta w, which is the first variation of the deflection. And this is as typically what we did before in the previous video for the minimum of potential energy principle. Make sense? So, to get rid of this thing, we have to apply the derivative to all of these different terms. So this like two different terms, but remember that delta, it should, it is a derivative for the displacement. It is the variation over the displacement, over the W itself. So there is no first variation, there is no variation for Z, there is no variation for the X, the derivative X, the only variation is just for the W. So this delta can be directly applied to the W and this Z and comma X, X it is like, or the derivative with respect to like constants. So we're gonna have here the integration over the volume of sigma X, X, make sense, times the negative of Z, the first variation of W comma X, X. We can work in this way. Just make, let us do it step by step. Then this, this negative Z, we can just move it outside here to be like negative Z comma X, X, no problem. Now we have to get rid of this derivative as we did. So we have to apply the, uh, the concept of the integration by parts, right? And the, uh, the concept of the fundamental of lemma uh, variational calculus. So doing so, this term will be expanded into a very, like integration over the volume plus there is an integration over the surface as we did before, right? So the integration of the volume will be the z, negative z sigma x x. Then this derivative will be directly subject or applied to the sigma x x. So we're gonna have a second derivative to the sigma. But remember, we mentioned that if you did one, just one derivative, so this is sigma x x, if we did just one derivative, we have to multiply by a negative sign. If we did another derivative, so we're going to multiply another negative sign, so this is going to give us negative. You got my point? So we still have here a negative outside. If we have a third one, so we're going to have another negative, so it would be positive and so on. So as you add more derivative, you are adding more negative. You're multiplying times more negative. Make sense? This is going to give us the first variation of W. All of this should be integration over the volume. Plus, there is integration over the surface. Of what? Here, we do have the first derivative, we do have the second derivative, so this delta it will be split into two deltas. It will be split into two deltas, how? So it will be split, like we do have the, z, the negative z sigma x x, then we're gonna have here the first variation of the w comma x, and there should be like an x here. Because if you remember that we remove, we remove, so this term will be w comma x, and then we're gonna multiply the normal to the x-axis. To get because we remove this x. Plus, because we still need to get rid of this term. So plus the negative. Z, so this negative, this should be like negative Z, sigma X, X, and we, then we're gonna have in X, but delta W only. Make sense? And then it means that to get rid of this derivative, of this negative, so we're gonna have, apply here one comma X, and in X, delta W in this form, and since we already did one derivative, so there should be one negative, so this will be converted to P positive. So again, how this term is working. So for the integration over the surface, here we do have the first variation of the second gradient of the displacement. The second. And what we explained over the first video, the previous video for the minimum potential energy, that we had the case that we have the first variation of the first of, of the first gradient of the displacement. One gradient of the displacement. Here we do have the second derivative of the displacement, or the second gradient of the displacement, which is this comma xx. So it means that this term it should be split into two variations. One, the first variation with respect to the gradient of W, then plus another variation of the W with respect to uh, uh, the first variation of W itself. Make sense? So it will be split into two terms. Why? Because we do have two variations. So this term will be 
in this form plus the integration over the surface of what? Of this negative z sigma xx as it is, which is this term. And then this term will be the first variation of w comma x. And since we get rid of n uh, of 1x, this will be converted into like over the surface, like going to give us the nx, the norm, the unit normal to the surface. So this is the first term plus another term. There should be another term, but with this variation with respect to w. So to get rid of this w, this uh, comma x should be added to the, should be uh, applied to the sigma xx. So this is going to give us the negative z sigma xx comma x. And since we are, are going to apply one, derivative with respect to x so there should be a negative sign we have to multiply times negative sign so this is going to give us positive make sense so this is going to give us positive here and then we're going to have the nx and all of this should be first variation over w all of this term should be integrated over the surface these two terms define the boundary conditions of this euler bernoulli beam or any beam but but generally this is for the euler bernoulli beam. So this is the first variation of the strain energy of this euler bernoulli beam is going to have one term as integration over the volume, and there should be another term. And as you can see, this is the first variation of the displacement or the beam deflection. Here we do have the first variation of the displacement, and we do have here a special boundary condition for beam structure. This boundary condition is special for this beam structure, which depends on the first variation of the gradient of the displacement, which is commonly known as the slope in beam structure. This, this is the slope in the beam structure. It is also should be considered as one of the boundary conditions. If we decided to apply Newton methods, we weren't going to able to understand and we weren't going to able to drive this type of boundary conditions unless we understand that there should be boundary condition as a slope of the beam uh, structure or the gradient of the beam uh, deflection that should be applied or considered, right? So this is the good thing of the variational method, but so we drive with these boundary conditions automatically. So this is for the first variation of the strain energy. How about the work done? The first variation of the work done. We said that for the generally, the first variation of the work done, it should be uh, the uh, negative of the integration over the volume of Fi times the delta Ui dv and negative the integration over the surface of the Ti, which is the surface traction, times the delta Ui ds. Make sense? So this is for the uh, first variation of the work done or the potential energy due to the external work or forces acting on the beam. Make sense? But if we decided to write this one into the expanded form, what is the expanded form of this term? So this is going to give us the negative of the integration over the volume of fx, the delta ux. Remember that we don't have any delta uy. So the delta uy term will be zero. Or let us write the fy delta uy plus the fz, the delta uz. Make sense? And this should be integration over the volume, negative the integration over the surface of the Tx delta Ux plus the Ty delta Ui plus the Tz delta Uz. And this should be integration over the surface as well. Remember that we don't have Ui, we don't have Ui. And also, we do have this as W, which is the beam deflection, right? And we do have this term as the negative Z W comma X. And this should be the negative z w comma x. Make sense? So doing so, we're going to end up, if you just plug these things for u x and u y by these values, so we're going to have for the first time integration over the volume of the f x, which is a body force, but it should be like the negative z f x times the first variation of w comma x sense and plus we can to get rid of this w we can is we can add another term we're gonna add another i'm still working over this term i'm gonna add another term to get rid of this comma x so there should be here the negative z fx this is the second term but comma x because you're gonna do one derivative with respect to x so this is gonna give us positive because there is another sign and 
variation of the deflection. So as you can see, this term has been split into two terms because of the variation over a gradient of the beam deflection. Plus, the Fz times the derivative, the first variation of the, which is delta W, and there is no other term that can be added here. And all of this should be integration over the volume. And negative, the integration over the surface. Do the same for Tx. Tx also, it will be split into two terms. So we're going to have negative Z. Tx, right, the first variation of W comma X. Then we're going to have another term, which also is going to be negative Z, the Tx, but comma X. So this should be positive of the W delta W plus the Tz, the delta W, as already given here. This should be integration over the surface. Make sense? So we're going to find some measures here. Some things like this term and like this term. The same thing here. We can define these terms in a different way. Like, for example, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to work over this integration because if we're going to reset back again to this beam structure, going back again to this beam structure here. It has x coordinate, and it should have a length, L. This, like, L it stands for the beam length, and it should have, like, a cross section. So assume that this is the cross section of the beam. It would be square, it would be circular, it would be in a form. So assume a square beam with a height. So definitely we're going to have here a height. This beam will be with a height h, and it will be with a with B, where this should be definitely the Y axis and this is gonna give us the Z axis, right? This is the cross section of the beam. So all of these physical quantities, all of these quantities, the only dependent on X, like the beam deflection is a function of X. There is no dependency on the Y coordinate. There is some de dependency over the Z coordinate, yes, but I mean, there is no variation of these quantities over the cross section of the beam and the variation only over the length. Like the beam deflection changes over the length, but it is still the same over at any point belong to the beam cross section. It means there is no dependency over the beam cross section. And this, this encourages us to somehow to work over this volume integration. We gonna split, we can split this volume integration into integration over the, the, the cross-sectional area of the beam and integration over the beam length, right? And we can do even the same for the first variation of U. So these are the two first variations here. And now we what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna work over them again, but after splitting the delta u so what i'm gonna do i'm just gonna split this integration this volume integration into integration over the area and integration over the length so i'm gonna work over this term on the side here so let us have this first term which is the integration over the volume of the negative z sigma xx sigma xx comma x comma xx Time the first variation of W, dV. We already drive this one for the strain energy up there, right? We can, that is fine if we write this one as the integration over the area, and there is another integration over X, which is the beam length, I mean, or over the length of the beam, okay? And the negative Z, sigma XX, all, it should be comma XX. That is fine to write this word because there is anyway there is no derivative of z with respect to x, right? So it means that that is fine to have this one as like open two parentheses in this way, delta w, and this is gonna give us the integration over x, then we're gonna have the integration over the area. Make sense? Then what we can even block the area or we can switch. Let us switch to be more clear. Like let us have the area, the integration over the length first. And then we're going to have the integration over the area. And here we're going to have the integration over the length. And then uh, here we're going to have the area. Then the integration over the x is going to be the same. Now let us work over this integration this time. Here. 
Do you think that this term is going to change or depend on the area, the cross-sectional area? No, it is constant. There is only function of x. And this area is function of y and z. So there is no dependency at all of this delta w over y and z or the cross-sectional area. So what does it mean? It means that it's fine to move this one outside the integration. We can just move it, reject this one outside the integration. So we're going to end up also another thing that this derivative it is already dependent on x only, and it is independent of the area. It means that the area won't gonna be affected with the x derivative, right? So it means that even this derivative, we can move it outside. So we can write this term into another equivalent form, into this form. So we're gonna say that this is integration over the length, and then we're gonna have integration over the area of only the negative z sigma xx d area and then all of this term will be double derivatives. Dry, uh, we're gonna uh, differentiate it twice with respect to x times the delta w dx. Make sense? So we can write this one because we move this one, this delta w, and we move the derivative outside. Then we can define this integral, this integral term. We can write this one as mxx, and this is the bending moment of the, of the beam. This is the bending moment of the beam. And this is how we did drive at the beam. This is the origin of the bending moment that we used to study in the structural mechanics or the mechanics of material classes before. Like this is the origin behind the bending moment. It should be the integration over the area of the negative z sigma xx, which is the normal stress over the beam. So defining this bending moment, we're going to say that the mxx, it should equal to the integration of z. And remember that I'm just going to move this negative to be more accurate. I'm just going to move this negative outside the integration because the z definition it is independent of the negative sign. So I'm just going to assume that this thing here, this z sigma xx d area, this is going to give us the mxx. This is the bending moment. So how about the sigma xx? Sigma xx, we already got it up there here into this form. Sigma xx, it should equal to the e star, which is lambda plus 2 mu epsilon xx and we already got epsilon xx before in terms of the beam deflection as the negative z w comma xx so let us form this bending moment in terms of the beam deflection so this is going to give us the integration over the area of what of z then this sigma should be the negative z epsilon xx i'm sorry it should be e star times epsilon xx where epsilon xx itself e star times epsilon xx, which it should equal to the negative z w comma xx. Make sense? So if we did the multiplication here, we're going to end up with this form. This it should be the negative. This should be negative outside here, or negative z square, the e star, times the, epsilon, uh, the w comma xx, d area. I remember that this... Remember that this term, it is independent of the area. It is independent of y or z. It is only a function of x, so we can move it outside the integration, right? So if we did so, this is going to give us the integration, the negative of the integration over the area. Even the e star is constant, right? Of z square d area times e star w comma xx. This term, if you remember from the statics class or even the mechanics of material class, this term, this is the geometric. So this is the geometric cross-sectional area, the, uh, the uh, cross-sectional area moment of inertia, which is commonly known for, for example, for rectangular cross sections for beams with rectangular cross section structure this i equal the b h square a cube divided by 12 for square beam structures with this way like this is the height h and this is the width b as we define the cross section up there so this at the end gonna give us the beam bending moment
This is gonna give us the beam bending moment at the end equals this bending moment will be mxx. It will equal to the negative ei times w comma xx. And this is the bending moment in terms of the beam deflection. How we did drive it this, uh, how uh, how we drive it this bending moment. So now, if we decided to use this bending moment and plug it here into this form, into this form here, we're gonna end up with another form of the strain energy, the first version of the strain energy, but in terms of the beam bending moment, and this is, this is the thing that we need. Also, if we did the integration over the surface, as you can see, the Z, the integration over the surface of Z, sigma XX, this gives a, a bending moment, but over the boundary, over the surface. And the sigma Z, sigma XX, comma X, this is gonna give us the shear force, if you remember from the beam, Class. So we can, given these bending moment things, we can drive or we can rewrite again the first variation of the strain energy into this form. It can be written into this form as the first variation of U in terms of this, bend, of this bending moment as the first term, which is the first variation this term. We agreed that we're going to write this term as the integration over the length over the axis, over the x-axis, or from zero to the L, where L, this stands for the beam length of what? Of the negative, because we do have here negative outside, and there is another negative, so this should be positive, EI, W comma XX, if we decided to substitute with the beam deflection. But let us write the equations first in terms of the bending moment. So in terms of the bending moment, this should be the negative MXX comma XX right because this term and there should be all of this term is mxx comma xx times the first variation of delta w right this should be integration over x the integration over the area is already incorporated or included inside this mxx plus how about the other boundary conditions term in the delta u so this term also this term will be m this should be negative mxx but over the boundary. This should be the negative of mxx. And this term, it should be the z, the integration of z mxx, sigma xx is gonna give us mxx comma x. There should be comma x here, right? So the if we did the integration over the surface, and instead of doing the integration over the surface, the integration is gonna be done over the x because the surface include surface boundary for the area and surface boundary for the lengths but we're gonna collect the surface boundary for the area too and we convert it into moment so we're gonna have here the negative of mxx and we're gonna have here the nx the first variation of w comma x and we do have another term here plus the mxx comma x the first variation of nx the first variation of w all of this should be in, uh, integrated over the surface of X, over the boundary. So this circle indicates that there is a boundary over the X direction. Make sense? So this is for the first variation of U. Let us do the same for the first variation of the work done, of this term. So this term, if we split it into area and, and length, the integration over the area of Z if x this definitely is gonna give us like a kind of moment but this is external body moment this is body moment that is already internally acting over the continuum but it is like external moment coming acting over the uh, particle located inside the core the same thing this is gonna be the derivative of this moment the derivative of this moment and this is just gonna be a force acting in the z direction. So we're gonna say that these terms, if we decided to get rid of the integration and incorporate it into other measures, so we're gonna say that we do have here the first variation of v is gonna be the negative, because there should be negative here, as I remember, right? Yeah, so this negative will be outside here, and so we're gonna have here the integration. We can even do the integration from zero to L of the negative m bar. I'm just gonna give this m bar to distinguish this m because it should be different than this m. This is the bending moment that's related to the stress, but this is the external work. This is the external moment. 
that acting on the body particle or the particle located inside the core of the continuum. So this M bar, it should be like M bar body. I'm just gonna give it like B here. And the first variation of uh, W comma X, of W comma X, and this is gonna give us uh, the, yes, and the other term it should be the M bar, body, but comma X, the first variation of W, all of this, it should be integrated over the volume, plus there should be a force, another force if Z acting the WX, w, uh, delta W, DX. So this is for the body forces, plus the integration, but over the X, over the surface. The integration over the boundary of the area, it will be incorporated as well here for this time. Z, the integration of area of Z, TX, I can write this one as a bending moment, as external bending moment acting over the boundary. And this is the Z, TX, comma X as the M as, as a shear force, or this is like the M bar, comma X. And this is gonna be like TZ acting in the uh, Z direction. So this is gonna give us here as the negative of M bar, but this is like surface, not bulk, right? Uh, the first variation of W comma X, and then we're gonna have here the M bar, the comma X, the first variation of W, plus the TZ delta W, all of this should give us the integration as over the boundary of X, make sense? Now we can even combine one of the things that as you can see this delta and this delta, we can combine these two into just one force and we're gonna give this force as V bar. This V bar, this is commonly known in the, in the beam structure as the shear force. This is the common shear force which should be the sum of these two terms together, right? And this term is just the bending moment. This is like surface bending moment. This is, we're gonna give it like M bar. This is bending moment, bending moment acting on the surface, acting on the beam boundary, the beam boundary, okay? But how about this term? This term, this should be like body moment. Assume that you already have handling a particle inside the continuum and you're just gonna give it a moment, give it rotation internally. In many of the cases, this type of moment, it is very difficult to be applied. So in many of the cases, this term will be in, not included, it is not practical thing. The same thing here, you are applying over a single particle inside the continuum, some special body forces. Or even we can combine this one as we did here. We can combine these two together like this term and this term, we can combine both of them into one force as like Q of X or any external forces acting over the continuum itself or like any, uh, I'm sorry, external force act, acting on the particle inside the, the, the body core. So, so this like kind of forces acting on the continuum. But in the, as I mentioned, in the practical use of these uh, beam structure, all of these different forms of the body forces are very negligible and or not negligible, are, are very hard to be applied. So the, we are excluding them, we are removing them. Except actually this force, which would be acting as a body force, as distributed force acting over the beam as to be distributed, as I'm gonna show you. So in, in these beam structures, in these beam structures here, as we indicated here that this beam would be subjected into some distributed force, assume that this force like B of X, this is distributed load. This force, we're gonna deal with this one as a body forces. But if, if the beam in the meanwhile, the beam could be subjected to, to moment and shear force at the boundaries, as already given here, V. So these shear forces, these are the boundary for moment and force. And this is the body force. So this is like surface tractions, and this is the body force. So giving this fact, and this B just B of X is just a force, but unit length of the beam. So we can combine these two. It means that these two can be combined together into B of X, which is the body force, and this term will be zero in this case. And 
this these two will be combined together into v bar which is the shear force acting at the boundaries of the beam and this m is just going to be the bending moment so we can write we can write for the considered beam structure we can write this delta v into this form uh, the this term will be zero so this is going to give us integration of, of from zero to l of the bx b of x delta w dx plus the integration over the boundary over the x this term will be the negative m bar which is the external surface moment the first variation of x uh, w comma x plus v bar which is the shear force the first variation of w all of this should be integration over x so if you open any textbook any textbook about the beam structure or any journal article about the beam structure, they basically define the, the first variation of the work done or the first variation of the potential due to the work done into this form. Why this form? This is how did we drive with this form. This is more practical thing that used for beam structure. And this is the first variation of the work done. And this is the first variation of the potential energy. So if we sum these two, Together, we're going to end up with the first variation of the total potential energy, which should be the first variation of U plus the first variation of V. So if we did so, we're going to end up with a very long equation that we do have here, the integration from 0 to L of this term is going to give us the negative mxx comma xx. And here we do have plus the P of x all of this should be multiplied times delta w dx so this is the integration the volume integration or the integration over the length then we're going to have here plus the boundary this boundary by the way we can write this one as uh, instead of the integration we can write like we do have a boundary this is another form or we can use the same form it doesn't matter like integration over the x the boundary of this term is going to give us negative mx nx, the first variation of w comma x. So we're going to have here the negative mxx and uh, the uh, uh, nx. And we do have here a similar term, which is negative m bar. All of these two different terms are multiplied times delta w comma x. Plus, we do have another term here, which is mxx comma x nx which is this term, m x x comma x n x, and this should be multiplied times v bar, or plus v bar, we have here v bar, this should be multiplied delta w. All of these different terms should be integrated over the boundary dx. Make sense? So this, according to the principle of minimum, of, put, uh, of uh, the principle of uh, minimum total potential energy, all of this expression, it should be zero. So to have this term equal to zero, or this equation equal to zero, so this surface integral should be zeros, plus the integral over the volume or over the length, it should be zero. So according to this, we should have this integral term, it should be zero, and this integral term also should be zero. So for this term to be zero for any value at any point x, you'd have two options, either to have delta w, is zero or you do have this term is zero delta w it cannot be zero because we are arbitrarily assume this variation of the beam deflection so this variational operator it cannot be zero so the only thing that it can be zero is this term so this is going to give us this equation here we're going to drive the equilibrium equations we are going to drive this equilibrium equation so the equilibrium equation here will be that this term it should be zero so we're going to end up that the negative m x x comma x x plus b of x it should equal to zero and this is going to give us the equilibrium equation that if you open any textbook of on the beam structures you're going to find that the equilibrium equation in the textbook with this form the negative m x x comma x plus b of x equals zero this is for the equilibrium equation and here we can drive the boundary conditions the boundary the boundary conditions into this form so the boundary conditions will be obtained which is going to be that this term. So we do have e or this integral to be zero. We would have either this term is zero or this term is zero 
or these parentheses are zero. So we're gonna end up with different types and different forms of the boundary condition. The first boundary condition that this term equals zero, it should uh, either this term equals zero or this term equals zero. So we're gonna have here, like this term, m the negative mxx nx negative m bar equals zero, or the other option that the w comma x equals zero or at least equals prescribe the slope. So this is known as the slope of the beam curvature. This is the slope of the beam of the beam. This is slope of the beam, it is one of the features of the beam structure that describe the slope. For example, if you have a beam and it's gonna be bended in this way, so at any point there should be a slope. The slope of this beam is going to change. The tangent to this curvature is going to change. So this is a slope at the boundary. This is one of the types of the boundary conditions of the beam structure. This is slope, it should be either zero or at least it will have a prescribed slope, prescribed value. This is prescribed slope of the beam. So if we define the boundary conditions based on this slope of this beam, this type of boundary condition is going to be essential boundary condition that depend on the beam displacement or beam deflection, or we can define this boundary condition based on the natural boundary conditions at the bending moment. So from this boundary condition, this boundary condition can be simply written as the MXX. We can directly write this one as MXX, as MXX equals negative M bar. Make sense? So this is for the first parentheses here. The second one, the same thing, that mxx comma x is gonna equal to the negative v bar or the w is gonna be zero or at least equals to prescribed deflection. So this is natural boundary condition. So we do have here the mxx comma x, it should equal to the negative v bar. And this is the first boundary condition, the natural one, or the equivalent one is that the beam deflection it should equal to prescribed beam deflection. So this is prescribed, scribed, beam deflection. So this is simply how we drive it, the conventional boundary conditions of the beam structure. This is the good thing of the variational uh, principles, that we can have an idea and we can simply drive this boundary condition and we can clearly explain these boundary conditions of the different structures. This boundary condition cannot be drived using the conventional Newtonian method, unless you have understanding of the beam structure and understanding of these boundary conditions, you're gonna arbitrarily apply them. But using the variational method, as we did here, we drive with them. So from here, we gonna, so, so starting here, just a very quick summary of what we did here. We started from a displacement field, we drive in the strain field, we drive in the stress field, then we did some variational work to end up with these two equations here, to end up with the equilibrium equation and the boundary conditions. So you could consider that the equilibrium or the governing equation here that we formed are started, we started from the displacement field, then we do have a strain field, stress field, then we do have the equilibrium equation and the boundary conditions. These equations are commonly known for only for any euler bernoulli beam structure, whatever it is. So from now on, on if you're already given a, an euler bernoulli beam structure, there is no need to drive all of these equations with more details of the using the uh, principle, uh, unless I ask you, like you, it is not needed to apply this principle because these equations are commonly known for any euler bernoulli beam structure. And that's why, and even these equations, this is, these are the equations that you used to use for the mechanics of material class or in other courses before, right? But this is the origin. This is how we drive it, these equations based on the principle of minimum of total potential energy. So if I didn't ask you to drive these equations based or apply the principle of minimum total potential energy to euler bernoulli beam, there is no need to do all of these formulations. You can directly use these equations for the practical use. Make sense? So this is for this equation and this what form the governing equation. So, but we form it here, the equilibrium equation in terms of the bending moment how, or the bending stress. How about if we decided to form this equilibrium equation, but in terms of the beam deflection, can we do so? Yes, the same thing for the boundary condition. So now what we're gonna do, we're just gonna form, form equilibrium equations and boundary conditions boundary conditions in terms of 
in terms of beam, the beam deflection. So to do so, it is very simple. Your objective is just to plug, is just to substitute this bending moment that we drive it in terms of the beam deflection up there. This is the bending moment, right? Your objective is just to plug this value. Remember that this is E star to be more general, right? Plug this value into the equilibrium equation and the boundary condition, which is negative EI W comma XX. So substituting here into the first equation, we're gonna end up that the negative and there should be a negative so negative times negative is going to give us give us positive so this term will be positive the ei the w comma xx and there is another second derivative right Sec, uh, two derivatives here with respect to x plus the p of x equals zero right so from this equation we're going to end up that the ei w comma x x x so there is four derivatives of w plus p of x equals zero this is going to give us the equilibrium equation for the beam deflection for the beam deflection and so this is the equilibrium equations equation in terms of the beam deflection and then if you already given a specific transverse force or even if it is zero you can solve this equation as you can see this is ordinary differential equation of the first order derivative of the beam deflection that can be simply solved by, by the uh, by using any analytical approach or even using a software to find uh, of uh, solving ordinary differential equation it can be solved simply solved for the beam deflection also the boundary conditions here for this bending moment which we got it by the negative ei w comma xx equals the negative of m bar so we're gonna say that the w comma xx it's gonna be equal to the m bar over ei remember that this e should be the equivalent flexural bending uh, flexural uh, uh, Yang's modulus or elastic modulus of the beam itself. So this is one boundary conditions or the equivalent one is that the slope it should be equal to zero or a prescribed slope. So this is the slope it should equal to the zero or any prescribed slope. This So this is the one type of the boundary condition. The other type of the boundary condition is that the shear force which is mxx comma x which is going to give us the ei the negative the negative of ei w comma x x x so it will be third derivative equal the uh, negative v equals to the negative v bar i think there is no negative yeah there is a negative there make sense so there should be negative here and negative here i think i've done here something yeah this should be negative and this should be uh, negative as well okay so this is gonna give us this negative will be removed so we're gonna end up with like w comma x x x equals to the v bar over ei this is gonna give us the boundary condition here or the other side the w equal to prescribed deflection so these are the boundary conditions all of them in terms of the beam deflection even the equilibrium equation in terms of the beam deflection make sense then we can solve this equation using any for any given p of x for any given distributed force so this is the force distributed force acting over the beam if there is no distributed forces here so this b of x will be zero and then you can solve for the beam deflection so if you solve these equations with this boundary condition this is ordinary differential equation you're going to solve this one and you're going to apply these boundary conditions uh, if you are interested in finding the beam deflection, but here, if you are really interested in finding the bending moment, you have to solve this equation and with applying these boundary conditions over the bending moment and the shear force. So this is like kind of external shear force. This is external bending moment at the beam ends, at the beam boundary. Like, for example, if we do have a beam, assume, let us assume this beam structure, assume that we do have a beam, that is given in with this form and this beam here it is uh, simply supported from this end and it is simply supported as well from the other end and this beam is subjected to a uniform distributed force 
so with an intensity of q0 so according to what we defined before b of x is going to be q0 it would be a constant value it won't going to be a function of x and here for the boundary conditions we do we do have two boundary conditions at each side like here we do have either the boundary condition in terms of the bending moment or in terms of the slope of the beam the one of the things that you should understand of this edge because of it is hinged so this edge can rotate so there is no constraint over the slope there is no constraint over the rotation but the constraint is only over the deflection so the deflection here it should be zero and the deflection there it should be zero and the moment mxx here it should be zero and the moment mxx here it should be zero these are the boundary conditions so for example if you decided to apply here you have to use the moment it will be zero there, there shouldn't be an m bar unless there is some external m bar acting here so you're gonna say that the mxx is gonna be equal to the m bar but uh, other than that this term will be zero the same thing the deflection is going to be zero this is for simply supported this is for simply supported beams for example for clamped clamped beams or let's say let us consider here the cantilever beam for a cantilever beam like this one the beam is going to be fixed from one end and it is free from the other end and this other end would be subjected to a force if and bending moment m and plus there would be some distributed forces let us assume that we do have this distributed load in the meanwhile with the uniform distributed load of intense intensity of q0 so we're going to say that the p of x for this beam the p of x will be q0 and it's going to be constant and here the deflection is going to be zero and the slope as well is going to be zero for the fixed end for the free end the mo bending moment mxx is going to equal to m and the shear force which is mxx comma x it should equal to f make sense either positive or negative x f depends on the it's going to be like negative f depends on the direction of this force in this case it's going to be negative f so this is like the shear force the mxx which are the boundary condition for a cantilever beam this is for the case of cantilever cantilever beam make sense okay so this is for these beam structures and how we can drive their equilibrium equation based on the variational principle and even uh, their boundary conditions even these are some examples of the beam structure the commonly used one in addition definitely to the clamping clamping beam is going to have like the deflection and the slope in both sides at both sides will be zeros make sense so this is the objective of this video is just to show you how we can drive these equations essential equations over of the euler Bernoulli beam for the variational uh, based on the variational concept of the principle of minimum potential energy all right so that's it for this video and another thing that i'd like to demonstrate here like if you already given uh, a certain beam structure you can directly use these equations and you plug them uh, uh, these given data for this in, into these equations and you can simply solve for the beam deflection or the bending moment the way that you want okay so that's it for this video and thank you and see you in the next video